Hi everybody, my name is Joanne Van Coral. Um, my mother was a Sheldon and uh, Phil called me up and said, uh, we need you to talk about apple dryers and the Sheldons. And I'm like, oh, geez, okay. He said, don't worry, I've got lots of information and pictures. Well, fortunately, I have some too. And we're going to have to have some light because I can't see my papers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not, I'm not hooked in, am I? I'm not plugged in. Okay. Well, you know what? When it's time to show the pictures, we'll turn the lights on. How's that? Whatever you say. Okay. That's good. I can see now. That's good. Now I can see now. Uh, as we gathered the information together, and I'm one of these people that uh, I'm not global where I can see how it all fits in. I got to gather all my stuff together and then sort and arrange and then it makes sense to me. Um, and as we're gathering the stuff together, I'm like, you know, these guys really, really um, added to the economy of the town of Scriba, the Sheldon family. Sheldon's and uh, so that's how I came up with the title of how many how the many generations of Sheldon's helped the economy of Scriber. So that's that's the route that I went with. So just sort of basic genealogy, Sheldon's have been here in America for an awful long while. Um, William Sheldon came over uh, from England uh, to Massachusetts with the governor um, I gotta put my glasses on. Uh, Endicott, uh, Governor Endicott, um, but they haven't really got proof to verify this, but his son John, born in 1630, and wife Sarah, they were in Boston for a while, then they moved to Narragansett, Rhode Island, I've said that wrong, I know. Then in 1679, I don't think John got along with his neighbors very well, because he petitioned Charles II saying that he had differences with the people there, they just didn't uh, get along. So um, he and 40 other like-minded people moved to uh, South Kingstown, Rhode Island. He bought 230 acres there, then he bought another 200 acres in 1693. Then the family ancestry goes from John to Isaac to Joseph. Now Joseph decided, and if you saw a map, Rhode Island pretty much straight across to New York State um, in line with Albany and um, to Stevenstown, New York. And in fact, that's where he's buried. And this is east of Albany in um, Albany County. At times, his name is spelled S-H-E-L-D-E-N because he was a Tory. He didn't get along with the rest of the family, so he decided to spell his name a little different. Now, Joseph had 13 kids. They, oh, this family can be prolific at times. Um, his 10th child, Paul, was born in 1768 in Steventown. He married Frances Hall, and they moved to Russia, New York, which is near Poland, New York. It's above Utica. And uh, they were in, okay, so here we had this map I get over here. Here's Steventown over here. There's your border, Massachusetts. And then we moved over to, we, did we have another map? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's Norway. And right where the blue box is. The blue box, okay, there's Poland and up above. I'm told that it has maybe 1,000, 1,500 people live in that area, uh, so it's not very big. And as you can see, from here to move pretty much straight across over into um, Oswego County is relatively easy. Well, he and his wife and family moved to Scribe. The uh, wife, Frances, uh, well, they, they had three kids here. In total, uh, Paul had 14 children by two wives. He did have a third wife, but they didn't have any children. And um, the story goes on how they moved here. He bought land in Scriba in 1805. So this is before the War of 1812. 
He bought 100 acres for $3.75 an acre. This property was along Route 104 East, and from the maps and everything that Phil and I looked up, we figure it's about where Walmart is right now. And originally, Scribo went all the way to the river. And then eventually, what would have been his property is now within the city limits of the Swiggle. Well, he bought it in 1805, and then in 1806, he and his son, 16-year-old Paul Jr., his third child, they came by foot, took them three days to arrive at their property. They cleared about 240 square acres of uh, land, and they grew corn and potatoes. From there, they went back to Russia. Now, talking with Phil, and we're just plain assuming, they had to, while the potatoes and corn are growing, they had to have built some lodging for themselves and for their animals because he went back to Russia, brought his family during the winter. <laughs> and uh, of 1806 and 1807. And so the whole family came back, and they brought a cow and a pig and a yoke of oxen. And Paul remained on that property until he died uh, in 1843 at the age of 80. So the weather around here didn't kill him, that's for sure. <laughs> now, Paul <laughs> Sr., um, his eighth child was Abel, and that's our genealogical uh, background. And I have up here, afterwards, you've got to look, um, a bit of genealogy. He had 14 children. So if someone says, I have relatives that are Sheldon's, yeah, probably true. <laughs> because if you start with 14, and we're the seventh generation, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of Sheldon's out there. Um, uh, Abel bought some property near his where his father was, and uh, that also would be within the um, um, property line of the Swiggle. They had three children. Abel had James Julius, called Duke, and uh, Sarah, and Sarah's maiden, uh, not maiden, married name was Hill. Now Julius Duke married Anne Hurt. She was born in Germany. Um, their property was on 176, uh, which we called the Whitaker Road. Their children were James, Rose, Frank, called Buck, Hamilton, called Ham, and John. Oh, I, I jumped ahead, didn't I? I'm sorry. That's okay. I think they can see us. <laughs> okay, that's pretty clear. And Abel's property was here. From what we gathered looking up the, the properties there, that's quite a experience. I had been in that the clerk's office. Um, okay, and now we've got uh, Paul Jr. He bought property on the Dutch Ridge Road. And this was from a map of 1867. That's just our doodling. We, where, where do we go from there, Betty? Okay, here are the handsome guys. Okay, here's Julius and Marianne here. And uh, we actually have another copy up here. And we have Frank, James, John, he's the youngest, Rose, and Hamilton. And looking up some things, sometimes on the censuses and a couple of the, uh, she owned property, a uh, couple of, it says Rosette, so we're assuming it's the same lady, because sometimes on censuses, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> I know. My grandmother was Cassie, and on a couple of the censuses, she's Cassandra, and that wasn't her given name, but whatever. Now, um, James married, we got another flick, Okay, here's the map of the Whitaker Road. And uh, so we've got Ham, or Hamilton. This is, um, give it a name, Fly. Hey, Fly. Hey, Fly Road. He just is over there, and I think right now, right about here, is that gas station. It's right on the corner. Right? Yeah. yeah okay. The gas station is on the corner. Okay. And this was Julius, so his son Ham 
is there. And then we have Patty Lake, that's important. And um, then Black Creek is down here. And uh, Julius's sons were uh, Lee, well, Ham. No, wrong, Joanne. Frank and James. And James's, um, Lee ended up there, that's James's son. It's, there's more, there's another an extension of that. Okay, all right. Then they keep going. <laughs> and we have Howard, and at one time, Maisel had property here, and Lee and Florence, and then John. This property would be, was um, O'Connor O'Connor oh. Farm, and before that it was Belcom. Belcom O'Connor's, and I don't know who's there now. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> what is it? Harry. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and um, James married um, Clara. I never knew my great grandmother's name was Clara. I always knew it was Carrie. Carrie Hale of Mount Pleasant. And she was the daughter of the Hale Cheese Factory that was in Mount Pleasant. And um, and here here they these are the Hales. And this is James Sheldon and Carrie. And uh, they've got their names up there, nicely printed. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we just thought that was a cool picture of them, so we put it in. Okay. What have we got next, Betty? Are they husbands and wives back and forth? Yes, okay. pretty much. Uh -huh. Pretty much. I, I thought. Uh -huh. Okay. So. Next. And these are the first cousins, the Hale first cousins. So um, there's Lee, Howard Boney, and Maisel, and Jesse. Their sister is bottom row left. Left. That's who I thought it was. And um, the so they are. And there's other. We have a couple of other pictures of first cousins and the wives of the first cousins, which is way cool too. And um, but James and Carrie had Jessie. She was the oldest. And then there's Lee and Howard and James. And actually I never, I always knew my grandfather as Mace or Maisel. I did not know his name was actually James Maisel. Mm -hmm. Things you'll learn when you do some genealogy. Cool. Um, okay. Um, this was the original Sheldon Homestead on the Whitaker Road. And it was, the, the farm was originally James and Carrie, and it was sold to Howard and Elsie, their son Howard, and then Howard and Elsie's son Earl and his wife Marjorie. It looks real different right now. Is that Barbera's house? Yes. Yeah. And then Carrie and James had a house built. And have we got a picture of that one? Okay, that's the which that's the house that my mother grew up in. Okay, and then it was Jacobson's. So this would have been Ronnie Jacobson's, well, Phil Jacobson's house and then Ronnie Jacobson's house. And I just remember nasty, nasty briar bushes going up to the door to the kitchen. <laughs> and um, they had uh, quite the agriculture enterprise. Um, my, it would be my great-grandfather, he, um, and we got that cow picture next? Yeah. Isn't that a beautiful cow? <laughs> I mean, this is 1900, and that's a beautiful cow. And, um, Hi Clark is, is showing, and that's another picture of that house. And along here is where my grandmother had those nasty brothers. Um, he had, he, um, was very well known for selling cattle. Uh, they also had sheep. My mother talked about when she was a little girl, little sheep in the barn. Uh, he also had the apples. And, um, they had the apple dryers. Are those the next pictures? Um, uh, 
I think there are more family pictures before the okay. before the farming. Okay, but James had uh, uh, quite a bit of property there, mm -hmm. and um, his sons were put to work for sure. And uh, he uh, sold cattle uh, to large cities, and um, there was a story in the family for my family on my father's side of the family. Um, my aunt married Dr. Baldwin, who was the veterinarian. And uh, after he got out of Cornell, the graduating class of 1903, went to Brooklyn and he worked as the veterinarian in um, kosher slaughterhouses. And he was there for a while and then he came up here. And um, James Sheldon had him come to the farm to verify that cattle were healthy enough to be shipped. And uh, he had shipped some cattle down there, and it was um, told, came back to him, I'm sure by telegram, came back that they weren't good and they were not going to use the, the cattle. And James Sheldon put Dr. Baldwin on a train to New York City, and if anybody had ever met my uncle, <laughs> Charlie, he was an in-your-face, loud, boisterous, man that came in sort of like a charging bull. So I would imagine the man in his 20s was beyond a charging bull. And having him be told that he wasn't doing his job, that these cows were sick. Um, my great-grandfather got his money. But that was always uh, a fun story. It was kind of funny because it was told on both sides, the story. So when my parents got married, the story combined. Yeah, kind of cool. Yeah. Okay, these are um, a few. This is the house that Carrie Hale had, had built in Fulton. This is Anita Street here, and this is 6th Street here. And one of her sisters built a house across the street. And they retired, sold the farm to Maisel and Cassie, and they moved to the city. And I am not sure. These are grandchildren, but of course, you know how it goes. They never put the names on the pictures. And uh, so I'm not sure who they are. This is my mother's handwriting. But this is Carrie and Ken. And it looks like summertime. My uncle was born in February, so I would imagine he's probably not more than three, four, or five months old in that picture. And um, that was just kind of cool. Got another one or yeah. two? Okay. This is Elsie and Howard's wedding photo in 1910. And Phil's got a very large one of that. But this, yeah. I don't know. Do we have a smaller one here? I, I can't remember. Oh, well. And this is the young family with Earl and James. And they all look so sober. And... <laughs> Okay. Oh, this is the one of the, the, the first cousins. So uh, the men, because this is my grandmother, um, Cassie, and this is Aunt Elsie. And which one? Phil, you got to help me here. Uh, Aunt Florence would be uh, this one here. extreme right on the bottom. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And who the others are, I don't know because the names were on the back. Mm -hmm. But we figured this was taken about 1917, written right around 1916, 17. <coughs> Where it was taken, we're not sure either. It looks like her name. Okay, yeah. Betty. Elsie is Boney's. House? Uh, Elsie is Boney's wife. wife. Yes. And Phil's grandmother. Grandmother. Yes. Joanne? Yes. A little uh, uh, side story about the house you showed in the last... Yeah, go back, Betty, if you can. Aww. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, that's okay. Burned in your brain. No, no. that's okay. Here it is. Oh, right there. Oh, no. Uh, too far. That house, uh, they built that house in 1920, planning on retiring there. And our great grandfather James, he only lived, he didn't live One a year, year and he passed away. Passed away. Yeah, so he didn't really <laughs> stick around to enjoy it. She lived there for a while and then came back and moved in with my grandparents. Because it, 
It was sold out of the family in 1936. Okay. So I, don't I don't know, know whether it was there. rented in the interim. We, you know, that part's a mystery, but um, she moved in with her son, Maisel, and yep. daughter-in-law, Cassie. And because my mother talked about growing up, Grandma was always there making doll clothes. She had a dresser. Talk about a spoiled individual. Um, it was full of doll clothes. Her mother and her grandmother made all these doll clothes for her. Okay. There's... Am I going? No, you're fine. A little more. Okay, here's the Hales. Looking just as cheerful as can possibly be. <laughs> this is a picnic. This is a reunion picnic. There we have here. <laughs> you know, you look at them and it's like, golly guys, you couldn't smile. And we figured this was the early 1920s. And that photo was taken at that house yes. in Fulton. Yeah. yeah, in the in the side yard. Right there. on uh, Anita Street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, other than my grandmother, great grandmother Carrie, I I don't have names for these people. I got the original up here. Oh, they are on the back. Mm -hmm. Some of them. Okay. Oh, and with that, just to show, there's, and some of the names are here, this is the rest of the crew for that reunion picnic. Okay, moving on. There's Howard in 1925. Don't those guys look so dapper? At least he's smiling. <laughs> Unlike his grandfather. Yes. Grandfather. 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 Phil's grandfather, Bonnie, and my grandfather, Mason, were the brothers. And that's Earl and James in 1929. That's my father on the left. That's my Mary dad. sitting in the back. That's her dad. <laughs> Hi, Gracie. <laughs> I'm here. Looks like Uncle Pete. There was a series. They came to the house and took pictures. There's one of my mother sitting oh, in the same beautiful. position. There's one of the four. The and probably one of the only pictures, unless Mary's got some of our grandparents together. I never saw them together in a picture. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't know him. My grandfather died the year I was born. So yeah, I know. Fun. But I mean, pictures. Yeah, but them seen? together now. No. And I'm, I, why I don't know, but whatever. I have a friend here, Bill Hogan, one of our old tribal residents. Yes. And he has a story about Ken Sheldon. Oh, we're going to share that because a little bit later we get into Ken. Okay. We're just sharing some family pictures right now. Right. And this is Maisel at about the same time. Okay, now we're going to stop right here because I'm going to get in. Well, what originally the talk was supposed to be about was the apple drivers. Uh, this beautiful peeler, which I'm told weighs an awful lot, and if you want to see it in person, you'll have to talk to the man in the back because he has it in his office. And we actually have a photograph up here. This is a peeler that they would have had in the apple drivers. And um, we wanted, uh, Phil and I wanted information about apple drying in and around 1900. Do you know how hard it is to find that information? Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we were able to contact, I was able through a friend to contact um, the Ag Library in Cornell, and they had a book, a 500 and some odd page book on apple drying. Um, and the book was um, called The Commercial Apple Industry of North America in 1921, and it's from the Mann Library at Cornell. Also got information from our good friend Byron Rowley when he was writing articles for the Valley News, and I have those articles up here if anybody's interested. So I'm going to go with what information around the turn of the century. Some of it goes to the 1920s, but the information I got from the book said in the 1920s about half of the dried fruit was exported and uh, less than 
10% of the fresh fruit was exported. Uh, dried fruit was in great demand from California and western New York, having the largest proportions of this commercial sale. Wayne County was the center of this industry at that time, but since they're so close by, I'm, you know, we're kind of moved in with it. Now, New York predominantly at that time used Baldwin's and um, Rhode Island Greenings. Uh, home dryers in New York created a great bulk of the dried apples. There weren't a lot of large apple dryers. This was done at home. Uh, a wife and the kids, this would be like pocket money for her. So a lot of it was done in the homes. Um, and you, um, so that, but then they still had, you know, some apples that weren't satisfactory for drying. So about the, the article said about 20, 30 percent of those apples were used for vinegar and other byproducts of the apples. The evaporators came in three classes. You had your natural draft, which was the most common. There was the kiln evaporators and the stack or tower ones and they were used mostly in California. There was the dry, a forced draft and that was a horizontal tunnel and a vacuum distillation. Um, the stack types where the air bla uh, blasts of air are used to dry the apples, uh, we kind of figured, Phil and I, that that's the apple apple drying process that our family used. And um, also it was pretty logical. And the apple dryer that was the Sheldon apple dryer, it was like built in the hill in the back, well, the back side of it would have been facing the mucks on the east side of 176. There's still part of the cellar stone wall there. Um, New York State backs from the early 1900s on the apples. It, basically, the book said there was about a 10-mile band along Lake Ontario from Niagara to Oswego. And at that time, right around the 1920s, 25,000 to 35,000 acres were used for apples. And um, But they said the most were small farms, they had 10, 20 acres. The rest of their farm they used for dairying because they didn't totally rely on apples for their sole income. And it said that the trees at the time were planted in the 1860s and 70s because it took close to 40 years to have them being um, bearing at peak. It said apple trees bore the best apples or their peak when they were 40 to 50 years old. I have some article up here from Wayne County apple growers in, I don't know, 1890-something. And they are preaching that the need of spray, the need of pruning to get your best quality apples so you don't have a lot of scabbing and other things. Um, about half the apples were bald ones. The rest were uh, the greenings and northern spies. I, did, I love northern spies. I didn't realize they were that old of a breed of apple, but they were. I also had, just if anybody's interested, um, this packet of the seven most common breeds of apples, um, and this was the turn of the century. Oh, excuse me, 1914. That's 100 years old for sure. Um, the uh, apples came in um, choice, prime, Poor, common, and fancy. Fancy being the very best, obviously. Said the prime were divided into two categories. They had the wood-dried prime apples and the wire-dried. And the reason they had the two divisions was because Germany had a law. They forbid any apples coming, fruit coming in that was dried on wire because of the um, zinc in the wire. So they had to come, all of your apples, when they were shipped, had to come with a chemist certifying that they had been dried um, wood. Um, we know that the Sheldons shipped to Europe, uh, definitely to France. Now, um, thank you, Byron, for giving uh, some information. Um, and he, in his article, was stating that um, first the apples had to be peeled, cored, and sliced. And 
that was the peeler that did uh, the peeling and the pouring. Then they um, had to have quite a few people doing this. And I think Phil said that his grandma Elsie had many cuts on her fingers running that machine. And it was a crank deal. Yep. Um, the apples were placed on prongs, turned with a crank. The apples were peeled and cored. Then they were dropped onto a table where there were at least two women. And they would do some fine uh, pruning or uh, trimming. And it said that in some dryers, this was piecework. And if you did piecework in order to make a decent weight for the day, you had to do 50 to 60 bushel of apples. <laughs> Um, yeah, in a day, yeah. And so now they're placed on uh, slotted boxes, and then they're put into a brimstone bleacher, and this was to prevent browning, because we all know apples brown real easy. And uh, now they are being, after that process, now they're sliced. And they are put on um, large racks, sort of a tower. And so you'd be placing the rack on the bottom, and then it would slowly go up the tower. And this is where the uh, air would be blasting on them. And it said that it took about 15 minutes to go from the bottom to the top. And um, then it was added to other trays. After the, that, there was a curing process, but Byron didn't tell me what they did for the curing process, so I'm clueless there. After they were cured, they were placed in boxes, um, typically 50-pound boxes. And it said that uh, they tried to have the more select or the fancier apples put it on the top, and they said that was that process was called facing. So the, the nicest apples would be on top. Um, usually a furnace was used, so obviously you had to cut wood. Have, obviously you had to have someone making wooden boxes because it sounded like these boxes being shipped were shipped in some places they said they were shipped in barrels but Byron's article said they were shipped in boxes so I'm assuming this area used boxes um, at this time oh now dryers continued until about the 1930s 1932 there was an extremely severe winter that killed the bulk of the trees so um, that, I mean that you put that put you out of business so, but from best Phil and I can figure out, we think it was the mid-19-teens that the Sheldon apple dryer burned. Because we have pictures of the people working. And uh, as you can see, they really did have quite a few people working. They are in front of 176. This is Carrie down here with her good old stern and her very dark eyes. Um, Howard Urboni and my grandfather Maisel and Mary, you've got your great your grandfather's eyes. <laughs> oh, very much. And um, so, as you can see, many women were uh, used. And this is. Elsie, right? Yes. Yeah, that's that's Elsie Howard. We're not married yet. Not married yet. No. Okay. That's 1909. This is 1911. There's not as many, but this is your fa your Elsie, father, Earl. Elsie's holding my father. Yeah. He was just. This is baby. James, and I have no idea why he's standing way off to the side. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Carrie doesn't mind sitting with the help, <laughs> but he's off to the side. Um, but from what we know, um, she basically ran it. The, the way my mother spoke, that she she run the show for the apple drying. I think she ran the show for about everything. <laughs> yeah, we might have taken care of the cow's machine and, and the bartering. She uh, standing off to the side. Yeah. Well, well this man right lot. here is Fred Fanning, and if anybody in the town of Vonley knows Lee and Faye Fanning, that's their dad, right there. And uh, we'll flip and you'll see, okay, here, here now there's Maisel. He's joined the crowd! <laughs> um, but I'm not... They're seated. Yeah, they're seated in front, but I'm not seeing 
Howard, and I'm sure Elsie's there, but I'm not seeing her. I don't her think they're either. in that photo. What? I don't think they're in that photo, but notice, uh, notice 176. That's it. <laughs> Literally a cow path, that's it. But this picture we were pleased about gave you a good idea of the size of the apple dryer. Because right about here, it drops off. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's that bank that drops right off. And this is pretty much in front of the Sheldon Homestead. Yeah. And you'll notice the chimney, so obviously there were Yeah, mm -hmm. there. And I don't know... I thought that was just a pole. I don't think it's a chimney. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you know Faye Fanning? And um, this, see again, there's that pole. And you can see just a little bit of the apple dryer here and here. I thought so. These are crates down here. And, uh, but still, what I think is one of the nice things about these pictures is we so often see pictures of way over a hundred years ago. They're always dressed in nice clothing. You don't know what they looked like in everyday dress. So I always thought that was really, really nice. And of course, the women had aprons and, and such. And, uh, but, you know, um, a lot of young people, this was a, you know, good... And I, I think it was a very short-term, like a month, maybe two months, and the process was done. But we kind of think it was late in the fall, because that's snow. Mm -hmm. And there's like snow down here, there. too. Yeah. They were having a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were. There's no leaves on the trees. So, yeah, I mean, at least the women are having fun. I don't know about the men. <laughs> so, Okay, this is Ray Dunn's more cider mill. This would have been in the um, town of Bonley. And uh, according to the article, he was using his uh, apple, uh, the tower, mm -hmm. they called, and he's drying grapes. He has grapes, mm -hmm. and according to the article, that was, <coughs> he was pressing grapes. Um, moving on, muck farming, uh, new venture, um, Phil's grandfather, my grandfather decided, uh, and I'm really not sure what made them decide to start draining the swamps, putting bog shoes on these horses, and clearing the land. Okay, Phil, help me out. I believe it was through... James's travels. James did a bunch of traveling because oh, yeah. he bought cattle and anyway he saw that muckland was being developed in other areas. Okay. And he realized, hey, we've got a lot of land that we own that could be developed. I also have a hunch that the apple dryer burned down. Now we need so they something. were looking for new means of income. And he is... So he turned those two boys loose. Yep. Go clear land. Yep. Lee was a little bit older and had a farm just to the north of him at that point. Yep. Yes. So, um, according to my mother, um, my grandfather was in his late teens when he started doing this. Um, as we probably all know, muck is very black, very rich soil. It's basically biodegraded wood and plant material. And uh, here, where we are, it's the land, the muck land, uh, is sort of in a small valley between drumlins left by the glacier. So uh, this is very deep muck. And Phil and I were talking, and he said the rule of thumb is you lose an inch of soil a year. And that muck was cleared 1910, so we're talking over 100 years. They've lost at least 9 to 10 feet of soil. So they'd be like, um, well, not quite as deep as this room, but close to it. So that soil is gone, and the muck is still black. Because when a muck is... Um, losing 
its fertility or whatever, it starts being gray. So if you see, uh, I know when you come off the church Road, mm -hmm. there's that muck there, there's some areas of gray. So that is like losing its strength. And um, so Howard and Boney and Mace started clearing land. The first was just across the road from the house. Well, James being the uh, man of uh, sales there, that's exactly what he did. The boys cleared the land, he promptly sold it. <laughs> and so Boney bought property down near Black Creek. And Mace eventually um, cleared land west of 176. But most of the land on the east side, father sold. Um, this is a picture of Boney. 1922-23, dynamiting, oh God, would he be in trouble today, um, and rerouted Black Creek to drain the Paddy Lake watershed. And in a second, we'll have a map of it. Okay, changing the direction of um, Black Creek. Um, you've got this drumlin here, and water had to go around it, and um, it wasn't working very well, so Boney dynamited through the drumlin, therefore changing the patio. <coughs> and um, they had an awful lot of rain there yeah, in the early I'll give 20s. you a little history. Do that, please. Yeah, in June of 1922, in a five-day period, there were two different rainstorms. Each rainstorm represented about five inches each. So you had <coughs> 10 inches of rain Added in a five-day period. And also, I checked the, um, I pay attention to the Syracuse Post standard records of rainfall for every month. The month of June in 1922 holds the record. Still. It's almost 16 inches of rain in the one month. Mm -hmm. But anyway, in that five-day period, that muckland on the east side of that drumlin, oh. over, over. East would be here. So no, east. Up to the top. East, would, the east would be. Oh, over, east, Yeah, okay. right there, that muckland, that Petty Lake area was like one huge lake. I mean, it was totally underwater. And so they had contemplated doing this for a few years, going through that hill. But that forced the issue. They said, we have to do it. So, and it was not an easy tax. That's a big hill that they broke through. Mm -hmm. and, well, you can see from the previous picture, it yeah. looks like this big. And there were other complications. The farmer on the west side of that hill said, hey, wait a minute. I don't want that water coming over on me. So he, he, uh, Brought an in, he got an injunction to there stop. We go. Him. <laughs> there he is. He got an injunction to cease and desist. But my grandfather and the three other growers over there took it to court. I believe it was settled in Onondaga County, which I don't understand. But they they won the lawsuit, and so they were given permission to go ahead with the project. And the dynamiting, the stories yeah. go in the neighborhood, really shook the yeah. houses. They really blasted the wind. But had, had that project not been done, that farming area, that muckland in that Petty Lake area would have been abandoned because there was too much risk involved with the, with the drainage such as it was prior to this project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Betty, we're, up, we're moving on. Okay, so that's basically how they came down through. And then this is Muckland East and West of the Paddy Lake Road. And, um, which is... And this is just north, of the, or just east of... So the 176, the Whitaker Road. Yeah. Okay. And Phil put this in just because we thought it was a way cool bridge that people actually traveled over yes. that in vehicles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
that was the bridge on 176 prior to 1929. Okay. Now this is a 1964 aerial view, mm -hmm. and uh, isn't that beautiful though? I think my dad took that picture. Yeah, I think he yeah. took it. Yeah, when we go up flying, it was always extremely exciting. <laughs> Let's look at the lettuce. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Glad you came, times. Mary. Me too. This yes. is fun. Filling us in here. It takes a community here to do this. All right. Yep. Okay. Now this is Big Boston. I have afterwards, if folks want to come up, I um, I put we have pictures, but I put together for the Vonley Historical a month book, which has been greatly added to, but in it is a lot of pictures of um, Maisel and Boney's mugs. And just to show you how stupid I am, well, I'll tell them that I got keep going, honey. Okay, there's aren't those beautiful onions? about 1940 and uh, you know today's onions could envy them absolutely you know white shirts and notice tie put that on I'll try there okay <laughs> my grandmother did tons of ironing because my grandfather wore only a white shirt on the muck he came home for lunch and he put on another white shirt and I'm sure his son did the second. I don't know if he did that in the later years, he didn't, but when he, when he would, yeah. So can you imagine in the 1920s and 30s ironing a white shirt to be, yeah. No, not what I want to do. Keep going, honey. Okay, this, Phil's got the original up here. And this is Howard and Oh, that is, um, yeah. what would you call that? All I can think of is a corn crib, and it it's was not an, a corn crib. It was, it was an onion drying crib. Okay, so it would be like a corn crib. Yeah, it's about 100 feet long, and uh, I have no idea how white it was. The remnant was still there when I was a kid, but it hadn't been used in okay. quite a few years. And then we have Earl with his crates of onions, and Phil and his beautiful onions. <laughs> I know, isn't that nice to have that? Yeah. And they're all smiling. <laughs> which is good. Good harvest. Good harvest. This is good. Okay, Dale Young, property Dale extension Young. agent. And um, this, um, how big was that photo you said it was on display at the state fair for like 10 years? Yeah, it's, I didn't, I didn't bring it, did I, Joanne? No. It was, it was large, probably two feet by four feet at least. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're ready, I think. Okay, and Mount Edna, this is um, the Sheldon, and there's, they are in with the Hales. I believe it's a 12 plot piece because there's Hale people buried there also. That's where my grandparents are buried, and that's where James and Carrie are. And that's, the last one. that's the last one. Okay. And um, <coughs> back to the story. Um, they uh, in the. We are not sure. Phil and I tried getting our head around it. Uh, in the mid-1930s, about the time that Kenny went off to Cornell Ag School, we don't know if it was before he went to Cornell or after he went to Cornell. Um, but Cornell, of course, is always doing experimental crops. And they came up with this new crop, Iceberg. My mother was always very proud that her father and her brother grew the first experimental iceberg lettuce here in Oswego County. Me being a kid, stupidly said, well, what? kind of lettuce did you grow for? And she just looked at me, well, of course, it was Romaine and um, Boston. And, the, and I'm like, oh, okay. Because growing up for me, all I saw when you went, drove around Oswego County was iceberg lettuce. 
And one of the things about the iceberg lettuce, and other lettuces too, uh, on this muck that you know really heats up in the summertime, in a matter of 55 to 60 days, you've got a crop. <coughs> so if you really got a good year, you can get two crops off of your muck. And uh, that was one of the things that was very encouraging. Now, <coughs> Mace's son, Ken, he had Muckland, but in his heart he was a mechanic inventor. Uh, that's where his talent really, his heart really was. And um, Phil sat down and asked me to fill in. Um, Mary, and you can make changes as I read. Ken was a graduate of Cornell, 1939. And uh, 1941, he married Jane Orr, and they purchased the Crumb Muck Farm and um, proceeded to build a house. Um, and while they were building their house, they lived with um, Mace and Cassie, so there was quite the household there. At that point, I think Grandma uh, Carrie had passed away, right in about there someplace. I'd have to look up. Okay, and in the late... 40, oh, well, he was, um, he liked to fabricate, uh, well, he fabricated the first roller onion topper harvester in the mid-40s. And then he became a franchise dealer with quite a few uh, specialized vegetable equipment. And um, there was quite a few else, Chalmer, Lamb Brothers, um, Iron Gage, Iron Age, Hardy, Myers, um, just to name a few. Boggs Equipment Corp in Heinz, Haines, sorry, reread that one. But what he liked to do is make changes, adapt them. A farmer would come to him, well, I bought this piece of equipment, I want some adapting. Uh, tonight, I heard one person say, well, every time I stopped in, he was always welding something. Um, very adaptable, both hands. So this was something that he prided himself. It didn't make any difference if he went in with his left hand or his right hand. hand. Um, he uh, did business in other areas, um, Orange County, Alba, New York, uh, Prattsburg, Montreal, Canada. Uh, I know he used to go into Vermont, too. Um, he made equipment himself. He modified and sold the equipment. And in 1980, Ken reinvented the onion undercutting machine. This new concept that he came up with resulted in a huge beneficial effects on onion growing business in our area. The old style onion cutters um, would take as long as four hours to do an acre of onions. Well, Ken's method cut that time by 800%, which is amazing. And in 15 to 30 minutes, he could do that same acre. It's a substantial time saving, but just as important is the fact that it does a far superior job. It lays the onion in place, there's no bunching, and there's very little dirt. The other effect of this is that it paves the way for the onion harvester to perform more efficiency, doing a faster, cleaner job. Um, Ken stayed busy for about three years building these machines, so as to keep up with the customer demand. And um, also to mention, he was very involved in the Oswego County Vegetable Growers uh, Improvement Association, also the committee on um, the Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, that pretty much, you know, uh, sums up um, the Sheldons. The only Sheldon left on the Whitaker Road is Phil. All the rest have moved away. Uh, or, and. Uh, I'm very pleased with uh, the people's cooperation. I'm delighted to see you folks here tonight. I thank you very much. And uh, uh, Phil and Mary and I'd be delighted if people have some stories about our family. <laughs> I'd like Phil Hogan. Okay. Tell, tell you what happened. Well, I'll just mention the fact that Kenny developed or invented a diving helmet where you could put this helmet on your head and you got air from a tire pump, which I don't think was blowing up a tire, but I was over to Patty Lake one day and Ken had it with him and he wanted a volunteer. <laughs> so he was stupid enough 
I said, I'll take it a shot at it. And I'm lucky I'm still here, I think. <laughs> anyway, it did work. Oh, wow. It, just, it looked like a pail you put over your head, the glass and everything on it. A regular diving helmet. Oh, wow. And it did work. But Patty Lake was treacherous whether you had a diving helmet on or it just in there. <laughs> I know the machine that the lettuce, the men, three on one side or two on the other, oh, yeah, they lay on their stomach and the they machine. cut the lettuce and it went onto the conveyor oh, yeah. and went into the right into the washing and the crate. Yep. Yeah, you beat it. Yep. They call it a mule train. It's a very <laughs> slow moving machine and the, you'd have four men out front you know, cutting the lettuce, put it on conveyors, it would come up, and then the people up on the machine would pack it, and then from there it would go back to a wagon. And, uh, I, is, don't you have one of those pictures here? I believe I brought it, yeah. 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 Oh, the, I think it's over there, yeah. The uh, onion undercutter was really, the concept he came up with, I tell you, was really amazing, the difference it made. Because the old style, think of a flat bar, a flat, a flat stock, and point it in the front where it would go under the onions. It was mounted on a frame, it would go underneath the onions to, to de root them. Mm -hmm. Well, you wouldn't go 15 feet and they would, it would bunch up. Sometimes, like I say, sometimes it would take four hours to do an acre plus a lot of work, you're constantly getting off the machine and cleaning it out. Well, Ken come up with this idea to use a rotating bar, a square, one and a half inch square bar. Did I go past it? Yeah, two bad. No. That's Joby's right. story. Right. Right. Yeah, that's Joby's story. Yeah. That's for Lito. Mm -hmm. yeah. Previous. Previous. Is that it? Yeah. No, that, that's a harvester. Oh, okay. Sorry. Before you can harvest them, you have to pull the onions so they lay down in the top drive. Mm -hmm. Because the, the harvesting machine will not work properly without without the top speed drive. There's this machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that old method, as I say, was constantly plugging up. It was just a nuisance. <coughs> Ken's machine used the square bar, one by one and a half inch square bar. It went under the onions, but it was powered, so the bar rotated backwards. And so, as it was going forward, it would impel the onion, so it never plugged. Dick Gears truck. Mr. Gears, right there. What was interesting, Phil, is he would draw these things during dinner time. I know. I wish I had the papers he would draw, these the equipment oh, he would make. No. This no. is Ken's daughter, Mary. His baby girl. Yeah. That was the surprise. <laughs> but um, every meal, especially Monday through Thursday, you know, at, at night, he would have a notebook on the table and he would be drawing the, what he wanted to build. And it was interesting. I learned a lot, you know. You don't think you're learning, but you do. Uh, does and, Pete um, have them? I don't think so, my brother. I have a brother in Florida, Pete, and my sister Lorraine is also in Florida. But um, I was 10 years later, and so I had a little different growing up than they did. But um, mm -hmm. he, I even got to paint some of that new machinery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd go down after school and paint, put me right to sure. work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I babysat Lorraine and Peter 
before oh, your time. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> well, Gracie, too. Gracie right here, Bonacorsi. She, she's like another mom to me. So. And going out to the, um, I think it was uh, Betty Gilbert, Floral um, Gilbert's wedding. And Jane had a great big picture hat. It was gorgeous. She was dressed ready to go. And we'd been, you know, come on, come on, come on, come on. And she went, and where was her hat? She couldn't find her hat. And he slid it down behind the uh, armoire or whatever it was, and she was wild. <laughs> oh, she was gorgeous hat that she kept saying, well, it costs this much, and it's part of my outfit and everything. I had never seen two people do that. <laughs> oh, I did. <laughs> But then there's the Sheldon dressing too, the salad dressing. That's still, oh, that's yes. still a secret. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know how to make it. Uh, I just, I had the recipe, I gave it to Phil. Mm -hmm. So they're going to work on that. She had that. And I was telling him tonight, she and my, my Aunt Jane, Mary's mother and my mother, were the only ones that could make the caramel sauce for our Thanksgiving soup pudding. Pudding. Mm -hmm. Which wasn't a pudding. Weird. <laughs> no. Bread. Bread. Yeah. Joanne. Yeah. Bread. Oh, yes. Mary's mother used to play the accordion. Yeah. Yes, she did. And I think she played with the Andrew oh, sister before she met your father. Well, she was in vaudeville. Yes. So, yes. Yes. They love to dance. That's why they fell in love. They both love to dance. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I remember her saying, she said that was, she was telling my sisters and I, this was in many, many later years, and she was living at St. Louis. And one of my prerequisites for my boyfriend was that they had to dance. And my sisters go, well, did Uncle Ken dance? Yes! <laughs> And they did. They enjoyed. And they the danced house. every day in the kitchen. We had a little 45 record player, and it, we danced every day. That's fun. Yeah. That's, that's, cool. that's a nice memory. It is. Oh, that's a great that's memory. It is. Yeah. That's why and we all love to work dance. She didn't in the dryer because she had gorgeous nails. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she worked in the office. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. She ran that office. Oh, yeah. She did. Yeah. For I don't know how many years, but I remember we went to visit. We'd go down to see Uncle Kenny in the shop, and Aunt Jane would be in the office. Mm -hmm. When your mother was in college, I went to work on Mason Cassie's farm with some men to take corn. <laughs> Can't imagine. In today's world, <laughs> I'd have been. I don't know to what. Do what? <laughs> anyway, I worked with uh, three or four guys. Suffering corn, and your mother had me come into the kitchen. She knew I didn't belong out there with those guys. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen with me. <laughs> Did you no, push on the mush? Not the muck, the dairy farm. And my father grew lots of corn. Mm -hmm. And I picked lots of corn, sweet corn. Joanne, before you go to work, your brothers and you were going down. And I need 600 dozen years of corn before a lot of And if you know what corn's like in August, you went, came back up soaked. Mm -hmm. Absolutely soaked. Yeah. Yes? Mary's brother, Peter, or her brother, used to be a mechanic and fly with the Blue Angels. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, they were going to come to Syracuse last week. But they had an accident. Yeah, come yeah. He was a, with them. He went all over the world. He never came home. No. <laughs> no, he didn't. He, and you know, the last time he was home, he kind of said, "Oh, you know what? I should have stayed here." And I said, "No." <laughs> no. <laughs> you and Dad were like, "No." We're all ready. He was a big, handsome, handsome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, I'd like to. Say a special thanks to Betty Oh, Atkins. she's been a big help. Without her, this would not have been possible. And of course, Joanne, I think. Thank you. Did a terrific job. Mm -hmm.